Mm. Should we have some sort of beep timing thing to to make it possible for us to line up? I'm going to put my headphones over the bike mic- my microphone right now, and then right. you clap loud enoughly, loud enoughly. What the <laughs> hell is wrong with me? <laughs> I will clap loud enoughly for you to for you to hear. <laughs> How about let's have an attempt at recording the intro and see how much we f*** it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, introduction, out of context clips, and general silliness. Yes. Is there, I think we've already done enough of that. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think there's a lot of that. Hi, welcome to Liminal Limits, a show about borders, boundaries, and edge cases. I'm Sarah Chikazul. And I'm Adam Sacklerides. And this week we'll be exploring the Alaska uh, Southeast, I guess you'd say. Uh, so tell me, Sarah, what is the Southeast part of Alaska actually look like? What What is it shaped like? What is the Rorschach test here? <laughs> it is sometimes called the Alaska Panhandle because, uh, like most geographical features shaped like that, it's sort of a long and skinny bit that sticks off the main part of Alaska as if Alaska were a giant frog frying pan, um, very rocky and snow-covered frying mm-hmm. pan for the most part. <laughs> um, anyways, it is the bit of Alaska that comes down the side of what is currently British Columbia um, and that uh, Canadians feel strongly that should belong to us. And uh, if you're if you're an American, uh, it is that part uh, of, uh, of uh, Alaska that you look at and you go like, huh, even I think that's a bit much for us. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if, I guess it's like, it's a panhandle, and Alaska is the pan, and then the Aleutia, Aleutian Islands are uh, the, um, the little bit of egg you've spilled while making scrambled eggs. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. We have to, we have to go farther back than, uh, breakfast in order to actually, uh, talk about why this, why this panhandle stretches down into, uh, into Canada and says, uh, screw you, uh, this is America, this is the United States. It, it comes, basically it comes down to a... Uh, dispute over trade territories between two crown sponsored monopolies. These are like companies that like, uh, for some reason, I, I guess you're the Russian government and you're also like, well, I need, I need a comp to form a company around this, uh, that I can have a, give a monopoly to, um, the Russian American company. And, uh, the Hudson's Bay company who all Canadians know for their, uh, uh, trademark striped blankets, and also the fact that they used to own the entirety of most what is now Canada. Okay, not the entirety, just the majority of it. Uh, so the the second part I get the stripes. Uh, sorry, go back to the stripes. What? <laughs> uh, all right. I guess I will include a picture uh, with uh, on the website uh-huh. uh, of the Hudson's Bay trademark stripes, which are red, green, and gold. I guess. Um, which uh, were theoretically once on trade blankets, but all I know is it's part of the Hudson's Bay Company, because Hudson's Bay Company is now, or The Bay, is now a a department store. Uh, But once upon a time, it was a vast fur trading empire. And uh, all of us grew up with The Bay, and many of us have fond childhood nostalgic memories of Bay-branded things, uh, which is a very weird feeling to have about a department store and also a you know, former trade monopoly. <laughs> no, I get it. Uh, you know, we, uh, some people feel very strongly about Macy's in, uh, in, uh, in, in, you know, big cities like New York or, uh, I guess Walmart. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, I guess the, the thing that makes the, the Bay very interesting is once upon a time, they got into a trade dispute with Russia, uh, that resulted in there, uh, being a bit of the United States stuck to the side of British Columbia. British Columbia, for those who are not familiar, is a province in Canada, the one on the west coast. It's a... Uh, like, y- yeah. Okay, we'll put up a map. There'll be a map. <laughs> it's like if you had a bigger version of California. Probably. Yeah, well, it's got a bend in it, right? There's a bend yeah. there. Yeah, We have. I'm a, just trying... We have a Lake Tahoe at our bend. What do you have? Let's see. I'm double clicking on it. Uh, you got... Uh, no, no, nothing in particular. Yeah. It's just, it's like, just an arbitrary bend for no reason. The, well, that's because that's where it stops following a uh, line of longitude and starts following the Rocky Mountains. Which, uh, oh, well, well, we, there's, uh, there's other things that uh, follow uh, mountain peaks, uh, as mm-hmm. we will get into later. Uh, so we have the Russian-American company uh, mm-hmm. that has already explored the Alaskan... Uh, the Alaskan uh, 
uh, mountains, and the Hudson Bay Company, which apparently just owns whatever the heck is westward. The Russians did not uh, actually, you know, explore the mountains, and that's part of why we ended up in a, a trade dispute there. Uh, the Russians just sort of came down the coast and made a couple settlements and trading posts, but they, they stayed on the water, uh, mostly because it's a lot easier to just sail around and land occasionally uh, <laughs> than hiking through mountains. And also, uh, the local Tlingit people did not, they had their own trading empires, and they traded with the peoples of the interior and then uh, acted as middlemen with these... Uh, uh, white traders, uh, so they they did not want other people horning in on their trade networks, and they strongly discouraged anyone from uh, uh, from cutting them out of the trade. Oh, geez. Uh, so this is all over uh, furs and uh, other things up there. That's uh, probably the primary thing. I didn't do too much research into the actual trade goods of this particular part of the country, but in most parts of that latitude, things like furs were the primary trade of the um, local peoples. Um, and Russia had been in there for quite a long time since the, definitely sometime in the 1700s, they had created a few settlements in what is now Southeast Alaska. Um, and they actually settled as far as California at one point and tried to maintain an empire, but they were stretched really thin. They didn't have a- What? Yeah. Uh, Holy. They, they didn't have a lot of support from the Russian government. They had a lot of trouble maintaining um, supplies at some of their settlements. Uh, so that's why they ended up signing agreements with the U.S. and Britain in 1825. I wrote that number down because I'm not great with dates. Um, <laughs> it's all right. So that they could define the, what their territory was and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. agreed to have some supplies from these other traders. Um, the, Br the British traders mostly being representatives of the Hudson's Bay Company or other trade. There were other trading companies at the time. The Bay was just the biggest of them and, you know, absorbed some of them as they went along. Because uh, both the U.S. and Britain kind of wanted to horn in on this territory. They were all making deals and trying to cut each other out of trade so that they could gain more monopoly. So when do things like start to start of, start of solidify? They're like they're, There's got to be a contract of some sort. Yeah, the 1825 agreement, that is the document that sort of defined what the border is uh, currently between Alaska and British Columbia. Unfortunately, because, well, I guess, unfortunately, nobody really hiked through that area and, like, drew a line or anything. So the definition of the border was pretty vague. I actually have uh, the relevant section cut out here, and I'm going to give you mm -hmm. a quote. Mm -hmm. The line of demarcation shall follow the summit of the mountains situated parallel to the coast. Uh, it does specify some certain degrees of uh, longitude and latitude, but the that is the that is the boundary is um, shall follow the summit of the mountains situated parallel to the coast. We can see some mountains. They're over there. That's where we stop. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, they also did say that uh, if the mountains are further than ten marine leagues from the coast, then the line shall be formed by a line parallel to the windings of the coast, and which shall never exceed the distance of ten marine leagues therefrom. Uh, this is this is great. I could listen to you speak old-fashioned legalese all day, <laughs> but this, this like, uh, when does it actually, like, become a problem? It's, uh, you know, like, it, 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 could, it, could, it could just be, like, you know, no man's land out there forever, because nobody's yeah. out there, right? Nobody's, yeah, nobody's I mean ever coming out. I mean, the, like, the Tlingit people lived there, um, and they were perfectly happy with nobody tramping through their territory, and mostly nobody cared about tramping through their territory. They just came through and bought some furs occasionally, and uh, everything was fine until gold was found. Oh, dear. And then suddenly exactly where that border was became important because then it mattered uh, who had the right to make uh, gold claims. Well, it certainly isn't the uh, original, the Aboriginal people, right? It's never, it's never them. They'd never <laughs> have a right to the thing. So uh, let's draw some lines as white people. Exactly. So the actual, like, there were a bunch of little gold rushes in that general northern area. Um, but the big one is the Klondike Gold Rush that started in 1896. The Klondike Gold Rush, it was so named because uh, that's where they originally discovered the uh, ice cream sandwiches. Yes, yes. They just in the river there, like huge piles of them. Or gold. I don't know. One of those. <laughs> as far as I can determine, the best way to get up into 
uh, what is now Yukon Territory of Canada, uh, where the the main uh, gold rush was, was to go by water as far as possible. Um, and there's this particular inlet, um, I guess Lynn Canal, which is now um, the head of which was Skagway, which is still the current name of the town there, Skagway. Mm-hmm. That was, uh, and then transfer to land there was the fastest and best way to get. Uh, up to the Klondike, and oh, we forgot a step. Nope, oh, sorry. The Russians sold this territory to the states at one point. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my gosh. We totally okay. It's we'll- we we skipped over the part where this is no longer Russian territory. The Russians, as I said, had trouble supplying their stuff, so they got bored. No, not bored. They got tired. They got tired of trying to maintain it, and just was like, "You'll give us some money. Sure, it's yours now." And I read that they were the Russians were actually like, as you said, they were having trouble maintaining apparently uh, places all the way far south as like uh, California, and. Uh, I guess the idea was just that, like, well, they were too afraid to lose the lose it to the British, and so they're like, well, I guess we should just sell it to somebody else because at least then the uh, you know the British don't have it, <laughs> and then it's no longer then then we've neutralized the threat. Like the that's that yeah. mentality of the enemy of the enemy is my friend, and yes. so I'm just gonna sell it. Um, uh, uh, apparently there's like a there's also the secretary of state at the time was um a mr seward and it was called seward's folly because like oh, oh right. because you you've bought this ridiculous land up in this frozen tundra this middle of nowhere why would they, we possibly want that but apparently actually it wasn't viewed uh so critically at the time that way a lot of people thought at the time like yeah hey, this that's okay you know you got a pretty good deal and uh you know we might use it one day and there's nothing wrong with having more ports you know more coastline mm-hmm. It's a, it's always a good idea. So, uh, you know, so that was uh, that guy's deal. Uh, it's not really much of a folly after all, I guess. And then gold was found and the U.S. controlled the best access point to it. So they were like, sweet, this is great. The rumor is that uh, the Americans would prevent Canadian prospectors from going through this part because they wanted to keep all the gold for themselves, oh, obviously. Those are just rumors. Uh, I yeah, in that I definitely f- Wikipedia does certainly say this. Uh, actually, I cannot. I don't know if I read it on Wikipedia. I know I read it somewhere on the internet, and uh-huh. you know that you can always trust everything on the internet. <laughs> Send all feedback to uh, neither of us. <laughs> um, but a thing that truly did happen is uh, Canada uh, was not happy with this and wanted to define the border as uh, some place that would give them better access to all this area. The problem is that the line of mountains parallel to the coast wasn't really a line of mountains. Like, there's a bunch of mountains, but it's not just one solid mountain range that you can be like, aha, yes, this is the crest. It's just, so there's a big argument over, well, was it this mountain that you meant or that mountain? And uh, the Canadian side was arguing that it should be as far west as possible and the americans argued that it should be as far east as possible so during the gold rush this was really going to be an issue and uh the the northwest mounted police actually set up gatling guns at the pass between skagway and uh and the yukon in order to assert where they felt the border should definitely be wow i thought those guys just had horses but they had they they had sent down an entire regiment like hey go go claim this for us and um (laughs) <laughs> were they okay <laughs> you know i don't i didn't see anything about any massacres so i believe oh, okay. it was mostly it was mostly just posturing rather than actual all-out battle but there there was there's a line being drawn in the tundra <laughs> i'm okay that was that was mean of me that is not a tundra area that is it's still kind of coastal rainforest oh okay oh wait not rainforest it's too far i forget the specific biological <laughs> classification of that ecological classification of t- that area should we take a time i out apologize should we take a time out and look up what, <laughs> what the weather is actually like there sorry climate <laughs> i have a book that would tell me i could go get it no, don't, don't worry it's not a big deal uh, um so they drew they drew a line and <laughs> they drew a line on those cold friggin beaches yes okay um Although it was not a beach, it was a mountain pass. Or a mountain pass, sorry. Eventually, they, the two countries tried to sit down and actually agree on a boundary. And they couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Canadians were like, well, okay, let's start surveying things. And the Americans were like, meh. 
It's expensive. Sending people to hike through that wilderness. Yeah. And, you know, so far things are going the way we want them to. So, <laughs> so tell you what, let's just leave things ill-defined for now. <laughs> yeah, until it came down to the Alaska Boundary Tribunal. That sounds very official. Very official. It was a, a board made up of three Americans, two Canadians, and one Brit. A uh, Lord Alverstone. Uh, so at this time, you're the Can- the Canadians. Your your foreign policy was still being done by the UK, I guess. Yeah, like I've been talking about the Canadians as if Canada existed as we understand it today, which is not at all the case. Canada did exist as a was no longer a colony. It had attained a level of independence, but Canada at that point was what we currently think of as like Quebec and part of Ontario. Um, British Columbia was still a separate colony um, and the rest was this sort of ill-defined blob of land um, that uh, I'm not sure exactly what a colonial type term was used to refer to it, that it that it belonged to Britain and Canada was trying to lay claim to it, but it did not properly belong it was not part of a sovereign nation at that time. Hmm. But the Northwest Mounted Police, which eventually became the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, sorry, I'll explain my <laughs> acronyms. Such things did exist, but uh, I, just to simplify it and also the fact that I didn't feel like looking it up, let's just refer to them as Canadians right now. Uh, the, the actual people who were on the board may well have been Canadians rather than people who lived in the colony of New Westminster or whatever. But definitely they were they were acting on behalf of Canada, but who would still, yeah. Um, Britain still did a lot of our international discussions at that point. So this was de- decided to be a fair, uh, fair tribunal. Britain, uh, of course, was more worried about trade with the U.S. at that time because Canada wasn't very big or important and already belonged to them anyways. So, of course, Lord Alverstone decided in favor of the U.S., uh, well, that's what happens when you have uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, you know, he's uh, he's he's uh, speaking softly and he's carrying a big stick. So uh, we were talking about this earlier, and I was saying, so I grew up, I grew up in British Columbia, and I sort of mm-hmm. learned about this bit of bit of Alaska with sort of a feeling of like it should have belonged to us. It is a thing that the Americans stole from us, them and their terrible manifest destiny and all that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And we really do feel cheated about it. But Well, we were sent by God, though, so, yeah. you know. Yeah. But in researching this podcast, uh, I actually read a little bit of the arguments made at the uh, Alaska Boundary Tribunal, um, and Canada didn't have a really good case at all. <laughs> I mean, well, so some of it was put in place by that very general, mm-hmm. uh, that very general contract that said, "Oh, it's um, it's to follow the 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 peaks of the mountains, uh, except no more than uh, how many leagues? Ten marine leagues. Ten marine leagues. Uh, so so much of the legalese was there, unfortunately, I guess. Well, the main thing was the 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 bit where it should, if the mountains are not or too far away it shall follow a a line parallel with the windings of the coast Mm. um which in the original french is actually sinuosities sinuosities i'm i'm i don't remember the exact word but uh definitely the same route as sinuous which doesn't really have a parallel meaning in in english and the canadian side were trying to argue that that meant that is like the ocean so 10 so we're not counting inlets and fjords and things like that. That's not a very reasonable way to read sinuosities. Like that, that kind of implies all the places where it bends. Yeah. The, 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 well, and the reality of this this part of uh, the continent is that it's there's there's the mainland North America, and then there's enormous islands here. There's uh, what the heck is this? Baranoff Island. These are all these are all enormous islands that are at least the size of Rhode Island or Connecticut a lot of them there there's just there are huge islands that are are in the way and almost contiguous but there's a lot of wide channels in between so it's very like mm, i don't know yeah so i i actually am i as a canadian feel better about the fact that this uh this little bit of alaska belongs to alaska uh because our you know somebody did sign a treaty and say that and our argument against it was pretty dumb 
Uh, and the only reason for it is if you drew the line here, then the 10 marine leagues would mean that we would own this little bit of an inlet. So technically there would still be a water route that the Canadians had full control over. Uh, oh, you're talking about Skagway? Skagway, yeah. But uh, the result of this was that uh, Canada was pretty ticked off, but at mm-hmm. Britain, not so much at the U.S. Um, because we thought Britain is our mother country, should be in our corner, and you just sold us out. Uh, and from that point on, Canada had a much stronger stance about uh, having control of our own foreign policy. So uh, a lot of historical analysis will sort of point to the Alaska boundary dispute as one of the uh, formative moments in Canada gaining more true independence as as a nation, um, more of a national identity independent of either Britain or the U.S. So it was you. T- you t- you you turned it into a learning experience as Canadians. You you turned it you turned it into a an, uh, into a learning experience, and you said we're gonna we're gonna take our destiny into our own hands. Yes, kind of. And also we okay. will we will resent these two countries uh, for the rest of time. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Happy ending for everybody. Yeah. Uh, in any case, the border is still it's pretty fixed, uh, but I don't I'm not sure that anyone has ever gone up there with a map and a compass and drawn a precise line there's still a little bit of wiggle room as to where exactly the boundary is uh, on these crests of mountains um uh, there's Hmm. some discussion as to whether they should resurvey it with satellite imaging but for now uh, nobody is currently fighting over gold claims so it has been left it's it's good enough where it is I mean, if kicking the can down the road was good enough for our ancestors, isn't it good enough for (laughs) us, too? (laughs) And as to what the original inhabitants thought about the border, uh, I cannot be too certain, but it didn't cut into... uh, It was interesting to me to see the the original map of the, the Tlingit's normal territory sort of follows the current border, uh, just because there's a mountain range there. So for the most part, their their territory was on this side of the mountain, and uh, there are a few other peoples that they would trade with on the other side of the mountain. So it's not 100% that way. But also, it seems like the people on the Alaskan side of the border got the better deal out of it, because they were not put into reserves and did not have to go to... I've forgotten the name of it. Residential schools. Oh, geez. Uh, so they... I feel even better about where the Alaskan boundary is if if it meant that there were a few people there who just got left alone to continue living their lives instead of uh, white people being jerks to them. So uh, you, they also avoided a little bit of the darker history of uh, Canada. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, happy, happy news for many, most people <laughs> in Canada. So that's basically all we know about uh, Southeast Alaska and the boundary therein. Uh, If you like Liminal Limits, you can check out uh, maps and such things, like pictures possibly of uh, Hudson's Bay Company trade blankets, uh, at our website, liminallimitspodcast.com. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Liminal Limits. If you gave us a nice review on iTunes, we would appreciate that too. Until next time, see ya. Au revoir.